Welcome back to Following Know It On, a Stormlight podcast. This week is episode 122, and we are rejoining Shalon and Adolin in Shadesmar and Lasting Integrity. Paul, how are you? Uh, rather, rather swell. Um, excited. Part four stuff we have. We see some unique characters here, and I'm really excited to uh, to dive in. We have quite a bit to cover today. Well, I'll just we say do. that. Elliot, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. It took me, though, a solid at least 10 minutes of reflection to get myself back into our Shalon storyline. I I flipped over the page and I was like, lasting integrity. What? <laughs> what what is it what is even happening in our in our storyline here? And then it even mentions like, oh yes, and, and pattern was the spy. There was no others like, wait, pattern was the oh yeah, wait, hold on. We knew that already. Like it took me quite a while. We've not been in this storyline for a while. Yeah. We I, we've only departed from it for part three, but it does feel like quite a quite a long time. Do you guys have two words to summarize the episode? Uh, we'll start with Elliot. Uh, of course, Th- those are not my words. I, of course, I have words. The two words are voices and gravity. All right, Paul. My two words this week are harmony and division. All righty. Let's use these four words and talk about Rhythm of War. All right, I believe... Paul, you have the same word that Elliot had last week, the week before, or something like that. One when, of those. When Elliot picked out Harmony, and it made me laugh because that was the title of a chapter coming up, and he kind of just jumped the gun with, this is how they're going to do it. So go ahead with Harmony. All right. Well, Harmony is is our... That's how I'm imagining our emulsifier to be. Um, It may not be exactly what it sounds like, but we kind of learn, which we'll talk more in detail um, going forward. But we'll kind of learn that our emulsifier for different lights is tied with our different tones. We know that they were like you use a different tone with these tuning forks to pull light out of a gem. Um, and it sounds like whenever you sing the specific tones, um, like the tone of odium and the tone of honor, then like together, then you get the light to come together. And so I thought I, I couldn't remember if, if harmony had been used. And it's fine. so I'm sorry if I stole your word, uh, Elliot, but uh, but I thought it was a good way to to summarize like kind of what we learned about our emulsifier here. Uh, my other word is division, and this is slightly a stretch. Okay, this is a reference to nail in our Venley flashback chapter. Okay. Um, the reason I said division is because I've always envisioned our skybreakers as almost like a good and a bad part. I kind of imagine the like is it gravitation the one where they can fly yep um, gravitation that that surge I, I kind of associate that with honor with being good our windbreaker sorry wind runners um and just uh, it see it seems good it seems kind hearted I don't know and I kind of associate the division surge as being more evil even though we haven't even really seen it used much we've seen yeah. um. I forgot her name now, but the one Dustbringer radiant that we've seen that was with Teravangian. Um We've seen that, and so I kind of assume that with put that with the bad side of our Skybreakers. And the reason that's my word is because in this flashback we see Nail, I feel like, kind of works to set up the assassination of Gavilar. Um, and 
I kind of took that as Nail being bad and sneaky and a lot of a lot of things. So that was that was kind of my reasoning for that word. Did you guys expect a prologue chapter in in part four <laughs> of like I don't I, I had no memory of this chapter before this read and I flipped to it and I'm like wait are we we're all on the prologue chapter we're, that's, not, that's not allowed Brandon Sanderson you're supposed to keep those on the pro- anyway I enjoyed it Elliot your words my two words were voices and gravity voices for this same harmony section that that Paul is talking about super cool chapter where we finally get some answers. We get the name of our book rhythm of war. We do. So fun stuff there, but there was actually a quote there that I pulled my word voices from Navani was kind of like wrapping her mind around what they've discovered. And she says, void light and stormlight, the voices of the gods. And I just thought that was like, I don't know. I, I could hear the, like dun dun dun, you know, in the background as I as I read that. Second word, gravity, or perhaps more accurate, the lack thereof, I guess, in lasting integrity. I'm trying to wrap my mind around the physics of this place was a little mind bed deep. When I first read this chapter, I, I do remember the, the physics here of lasting integrity from my first read. And when I first had read it, I coincidentally had just watched Inception like the day before. And I was like, what are you one for one ripping Inception <laughs> or like right into your book, Brandon? But okay. Um, before we get too carried away, Paul, do you have, do you have a mug? Yes. I was about to inter- interrupt if he's tried to go forward. I don't know if I would call it a mug but I have something. It is, um, it's a very large coffee cup. It is an exceptionally large coffee cup, which, um, I don't know what to, what to, it's a very large coffee cup. Um, is it bigger than your head? It is much bigger than my, well, it's about, yeah, it's pretty close. Head size. It's pretty, I would say it is bigger than my head. Um, but it's pretty close in size to my head. Um, and on it, if if you haven't seen already, um, <laughs> I'm very thankful for our new surgeon, Shoop Doop Magoop. So thank you so much to Sh- Shoop Doop Magoop, our newest surgeon. Um, I had to be careful not to write your name with like doctor's handwriting because it it was a bit long and it it barely fit on my little strip here uh but shoop doop magoop mick goop is uh very thankful for your support of our channel and this is a very large coffee cup that i'm going to proceed to spill water on myself with so by accident um but But, thank you for your support thank you for your support Um, shoop doop magoop thank you I, (laughs) I, i was about to say i think everyone should welcome shoop doop magoop I um, certainly took advantage of saying that you, name. I, you did. Well done, Trevor. <laughs> never, never be able to once again. I'll, uh, I'll pass. I'll, I'll leave that to the experts, you guys. Well, all right. So me and Trevor appreciate your support. Shoot, shoot my group, I should say <laughs> hey now. Elliot, Elliot can pass. You're me in trouble. It. I'm kidding. I'm joking. All right. Chapter 75, Lasting Integrity. So, yes, let, let's do a quick recap of Shalon and Adolin, Elliot, that you said you had to do before flipping over to this chapter. So, ba- back in part two of this book, we had the expedition into Shades Mar to recruit the Honor Spren to come uh, bo- bond Windrunners. That, that's, the, that's goal number one. Goal number two is given to Shalon by Marais. And Marais says, go find Ristaris. Ristaris is the head of the Sons of Honor. And you will know what to do when you get there, is what he says. He gives her this little magic Rubik's Cube thing and says, 
you can talk to me whenever with this thing. Um, and then sends them off. They go through Shadesmar. They meet a couple people. Um, Adolin jumps on Gallant's back and goes and saves... What's his name? I don't remember the honor spread captain from last book, but he's in he's in trouble. Goes and saves him. Gets injured in the process. That's right at the front door of lasting integrity. The honor spread let them in on one on the condition of Adolin is going to stand trial for all humans, or sorry, all knights radiant back at the time of the recreants. That is the. Um, that is the stipulation here. They let them in. And then right at the beginning of this chapter, we learn that Gadecki was let into Lasting Integrity to heal Adolin, so he's no longer wounded. And then Gadecki is uh, kicked right back out. So that's where we pick up with Adolin Shalon. And Adolin's greater mission is diplomatic, right? He's been sent there to talk to the Honor Spren and basically get them to help because they're refusing to help because of what happened at the recreants way back thousands of years ago. Correct. They view what Syl has Syl and some of her friends have done as stupid at best and treasonous maybe at worst. And Adolin is here to try to change their minds because we need more Windrunners. Okay. I'm caught up now. Ish. Ish. Right bef- and then on Shalon's part here, right before we walk into Lasting Integrity, she has come to the conclusion that the spy that she's been looking for is Pattern. Pattern has been spying on her, and the the implications there we, we will be exploring in this in, in this episode, I believe. So uh, I'll leave that there, that Shalon has quickly dropped all trust of Pattern, and that was the the big mic drop at the end of part two. So that is where we pick up here. Lasting Integrity is a huge tower, and they live on the interior of the tower, on the four walls of the tower. It's on the it's on the back of the book. If you need a, a visual, it's this big chrome tower here, and they live on the inside walls of it. And the gravity is just not non-existent, but whatever. We'll, we'll get there. What do you guys think? I was tr- trying to figure it out. Your your comparison to Inception is good, or some of like the the Doctor Strange Marvel movies get some you know trippy walk on walls kind of stuff going on. I actually. It made more sense to me when I started to compare it in my mind to an O'Neill cylinder, which is a, is. this is the, the space geek coming out in me. You, you've seen one before, I'm sure. O'Neill cylinders is the, the concept. It, it's a concept for a like colony ship in space. It's a huge, massive cylinder that rotates about its axis, and you build your city on the inside surface of that cylinder so that that rotation, get, that centrifugal force gives you gravity. But, yeah. but basically, like if you stood on the inside, you, you could look you know, up, and there would be the other side of your city right above you. Yeah. M- movies use them a, f- fairly, a few times at least, so you've, you've probably seen one at some point. It's pretty cool. I saw that, um, and whenever I noticed about all the gravity stuff, I I feel like Brandon Sanderson is giving us way too much fuel to just talk about like theory crafting stuff. I I say this with the music stuff that we talked about before, and probably will talk a little bit more about as time goes on, um, and then all the stuff with like gravity mechanics, engineering esque things. Uh, there's a, there's a lot going on, and I th- I think it's pretty neat, but also really uh, easy to just rabbit trail on, you know. I, a lot of cool I, stuff. I was looking very closely for a scientific explanation of this. I was like, okay, when are we going to get the how does this work, why does this work? And at least in these chapters, we don't really. They kind of hand-waved away as, oh, lasting integrity follows a different set of laws. Yes. 
They okay, okay. Shadesmar is whatever you think it is. So if you think that you can make a city on the inside of a tube, go ahead. I guess that's that, that's as much explanation as we get. Adolin, well, we jump into this chapter with Adolin. And he's doing some like morning walk that he gets to do. Um, he he's a prisoner, but he's they, they let him you know roam around the city. He goes up to the walls, which first off, I'm having a hard time comprehending how you go up to the city walls and look out on the expanse in this city that we've just described. Like I I don't know what we're talking about to be honest. Are we at the top of the cube? Are we at the well, yeah whatever. So he goes up and looks at the countryside around him and he sees the convoy that they came to Lasting Integrity with their other Knights Radiant um, and some uh, some of the other guys. And so the, they're all camped out outside the city and there are dead eyes collecting outside the, the keep uh, of Lasting Integrity. And one of the guards that is with Adolin says, oh, they are probably just, they can feel that justice is coming. And so they're, they're gathering around and they're waiting for, for justice to be served because Adolin's about to stand trial for, for their deaths. So what did you guys think of this? Just real quick, a note on that, that what the guard is saying the guard uses a term I wasn't familiar with there as the, they're trying to explain why the dead eyes are there. They say they have that connection. They feel that justice is coming because they are bound to the spirit web of Roshar. And I, I I've learned by now that oftentimes stuff is not a, a, actually the first time we're having it revealed to us is just the first time I'm noticing it. Mm-hmm. So maybe this term has been used before, but I don't, this is the first time I've recognized it. Spirit web of Roshar. It's there's no, like hardly any context even for us to know what that exactly what that means, but it's a new term, I guess. Yeah, are we adding it to the questions list that we'll read at the end of the book? And maybe Parshendi, no Dalinar. That's still my favorite. Let's Spirit know. web of Roshar. <laughs> yeah. But no, I I also I briefly caught that and didn't know did not know what to think of Spirit Web of Roshar. Honestly, and, and this is something I'm gonna I'm gonna tie into another point of our chapter here. Um just in mention. Sometimes whenever we're introduced to new like terms or people or words at this at this stage of our story. I just ignore it. I just fully ignore it. <laughs> and like, like here it's like spirit web. I'm like, okay, if this is explained later, I will start to worry about it right now. I don't want to worry about it. And in the same way, uh, that's how I felt with this. Like, Ooh, go find Ristaris. Like, like I didn't know who that was. And mm-hmm. so I was like, okay, I'm not going to worry about it. Um, either, either Trevor or Brandon will tell me, but what it is later. I won't worry. about <laughs> Yes, <it. laughs> exactly. I'm, I'm just not going to worry about it. And if it like, <clears throat> There's probably one or two times that it has turned out to be something that's not very significant or like a character that's not major, I guess. But in this case, um, we we find someone really cool. We find one of our heralds, uh, and so then it was like, oh, okay, Rastaris is Kalak. That's yes. awesome. And then I just get to be like, okay, okay, now I'm on the same page, but not like worrying about like, ooh, who's Rastaris? What's he gonna do? All that stuff, you know. Yeah, uh, but th- that's my treatment with the uh, spirit web right now. Your guess maybe something we already know, but um, y- your guess is as good as mine. I don't know what spirit web of Roshar means either. I I would be I wouldn't be surprised if we had seen it before, like you're saying, Elliot. But I also don't couldn't give you a definition right now. It could also just be a a mannerism of speech that the honor sprinter using like it, it maybe it doesn't actually have a whole lot of significance to it that's just their way of explaining how spren are connected and now that i'm giving it more than 30 seconds of thought this could be the mechanic that dalinar is beginning to exploit 
with his bondsmith powers, how everybody is connected to each other, connected to Roshar, capital C connection. And because they they just call it the spirit web of Roshar. I don't know. That's what came to mind. So that is Adolin's portion of the chapter. Shallan, we, well, I should say Vale. We don't get to see Shallan until later in the chapter. Vale and Radiant are in Lasting Integrity. I believe a couple weeks have gone by since part two. And she has been investigating all of the humans in Lasting Integrity. So she explains the mechanics of Lasting Integrity used to be a thriving capital, a thriving trade capital of they would let people in, let people out, and you could go, you could travel back and forth from like any other city. But then right when X happened, I think it's the return of the ever or the creation of the Everstorm, I think, is when they close their doors and that kind of fosters in 17 humans into lasting integrity. And over the last couple of weeks, Shalon has been going around and seeing if any of these 17 humans are Ristaris, because that, that's her that's her side quest from Marais. And today she is looking at the last of uh, the, the last human she hasn't been able to see. And it's some creepy dude who lives in a box. They call him 16 because he comes out every 16 days, walks to the market, picks up food and walks back. We can talk about him in a second, but that's, yeah, whatever. Um, she, long story short, she, she finds him and he's not Rastari's. And so by at the end of this chapter, by the end of the episode, it'll change. But by the end of this chapter, Shalon is convinced Rastari's is not in lasting integrity. So that's the conclusion she gets to. But before um, we get to the actual reveal of her stories in the next, in the later chapters here. Um, I want to talk about pattern in this, in this chapter pattern and radiant have an interesting conversation. Radiant just straight up asks pattern, a bunch of questions that Sean is afraid to ask pattern. And we actually get some cool answers. What would you guys get from this? I'm I'm not used to getting straight answers from a Shalon storyline, so that almost that that alone almost threw me off. That they're just they're getting right into it. Makes of, you second guess your straight answers. Of- exactly, exactly. Plus, we know Pattern loves his his lies, but and, and we've just been told we we can't trust him. But he does maybe win back a bit of trust here. I'm trying to remember what all what all he talks about in this chapter and what all he talks about later. So, he- yeah, I don't, I don't know if I remember exactly what, what he talks about. I do have a lot of thoughts on just like the conversation in general and stuff, but. So radiant asks pattern, have you lied to us? And, uh, pattern says yes. And then he, then she asks, have you used the cube? And Pattern says, well, yeah, I had to talk to Wit. And then she was like, well, wait a minute. Why, why are you talking? Like, that is not what she was expecting. She was expecting that he's spying on her, like, with Marais or something like that. But Pattern's like, well, n- no, I was talking to, to Wit. And then Wit gets overheard by a sleepless... And a sleepless then passes it to Marais. So that is how Marais got his information inadvertently from Pattern. So Pattern is a spy in the f- in the fact that he's trying his best to help Shalon. And the fact that Shalon won't help herself, Sh- Pattern is going around her to wit and saying, how can I help Shalon? And then... Marais finds out because of that conversation. Does that make sense? Yes, but I have a lot of questions. Yes, go ahead. Um, one, I didn't actually. Re- I, I I caught on to the sleepless shenanigans going on here. 
Um, but I did not realize that the sleepless are the ones who gave Mraze the information. Are they like? How does Mraze know them? Are are they associated with Ghostbloods? Maybe are they like in there somehow? If so, that I think that would be cool because I think that would tie in. That would be a way for Sleepless to like actually tie into our storylines here instead of just being like we talked about. They may just be kind of like an extra little feature, which is neat to to like know about and wonder about. Um, but like a way that they could have like a little a little sliver more of the the story, I guess. But the Sleepless aspect with Marais confused me. Marais is always confusing, but yeah. That that bit of info came to us a little bit earlier. I, I didn't remember that at first, but then it came back to me. It was either at the end of part three or one of our interludes, maybe. I don't remember exactly. But we had a scene a couple of episodes ago where Wit found one of his pens was not a pen. It was a sleepless. And so then he realized, I've been spied on by a sleepless. And then he talked to, I think, Yasna. Yasna about, hey, we know there's a sleep list working with the ghost bloods. And so they just kind of assumed that the ghost bloods now knew everything they did. So you had to take that bit of information and then pair it with this to say to see, oh, pattern told wit. And we know that wit is compromised and that everything that he knows or has been told, it has been fed to the ghost bloods. Therefore, that's the very circuitous path by which Shalon's trick she tried to use to plant information. It ended up getting back to Mraze through pattern, through wit, through the sleepless, through the ghost bloods. Not confusing at all. Right? Yeah. I totally, totally uh, picked all of that up first read through. Yes, exactly. But all of that leads to the question that actually I think Vale begins to question of for this way back at the beginning of this book, it's like the second chapter, it's like the fifth chapter of the book is ELA dies. They are they're They're in a undercover operation in the shattered plains, trying to find out who the leader of the, they're trying to exterminate the, the, the sons of honor and ELA is tied into this. They successfully capture Ela. They're about to turn, return her to Yurthiru. Ela dies, and so Shalon's like, "Well, either she committed suicide with like a a pill, which doesn't look likely, or she, or there's a spy here, and the spy killed Ela." Now we have attributed that death to the spy that Shalon was looking for this whole time. And Vale kind of like offhand things to herself. Well, wait a minute. If sh- if Pattern is the spy, but he's accidentally the spy, who killed Ela? Now we're back to square one with that. Of well, if there is no spy, who killed Ela? I'm. I think this came up when we had that initial conversation when that happened to begin with. I think we added. Shalon herself to the list of suspects. We did. Because we know she's got a running list of personas, including some that she may or may not know about and or have control over. Yeah. So it seemed fairly plausible that a version of Shalon could have come out, hid from the rest, assassinated Eli, gone back in, Shalon, Vale, and company don't even know what happened. So I think that, for me, has now risen to top of the suspect list as what might have happened there. Go ahead, I think I think that's really true. I, I, I agree with you, Elliot. I think that's what we're honestly going to find. Like I, I would make that a pretty solid prediction, honestly. Um, if we know that that is the case, where we like don't, hypothetically no longer know who Eli's killer is, then I think it's got to be this, like, what What was the name that they said? Was it Formless? Nameless? Formless. Formless. Uh, my guess is Formless. Um, or, or some other Shalon thing that we don't know. Um, yeah, that, that would pretty much be my guess. Um, Bouncing off of this, this goes into chapter 78. Pattern is talking to 
who is presented to the reader as Shalon. But Pattern has a really good way of recognizing who he's talking to without even Vale or Shalon or Radiant having to introduce themselves up until like through all of Oathbringer, through all the Rhythm of War, Pattern quickly realize quickly quickly recognizes who he's talking to. Except in this scene, Pattern assumes he's a talking to Vale, and Shalon says, No, this is Shalon. And Pattern says, No, it's not. You feel you you don't feel like Shalon, you feel like something else. And Shalon just dismisses it. That's a really good point. Um I, I do trust that like if anyone's gonna know, it would be Pattern. Um, just because they're they, her bonded spren and mm-hmm. everything there, you know. Um, so that could totally make sense of like Shalon's other persona. She thinks is Shalon, but is not Shalon. Right? Is right. formless. Um, right. And Shalon isn't even like there. Um, I will say I don't. Um, this this is I'm zooming out a little bit. Right mm-hmm. quick. Um, with Shalon's storyline, I am almost at the point where I feel like I feel like Shalon's storyline is setting up something for way later. Okay. I don't think Shalon's storyline right now is even really like gonna be a big book four stuff. Because reading this, I was not very excited. I was not very thrilled. I was thrilled with seeing Collect. That's awesome. But a lot of like the stuff with her and Marais, um I was I was confused why we're seeing this now because all of our other characters feel like they're very pointed with our like storyline development. We've got like Dalinar, Kaladin, everyone is like basically fighting the war. There's like a war happening. Yeah. Um and then Shalon and Adolin, like it almost feels like they're off on their own little thing. It is very like big. They're in like shades more and they're like basically hanging out with all the spread. They're doing a lot of like things that will probably become very impactful with our like other characters and where they are in the story. Um, but I've been trying to figure out where Marais fits into this um, and, and just everything there. Um, and so I feel like it's just going to be something like way later. Um, I also have just been a little frustrated with, Shalon's development. I, I was thinking of how I don't. I have no idea how you get Shalon's content in this book and a lot of Oathbringer. Ever this is onto like an on-screen adaptation. Okay, <laughs> just like with all of her different like characters and stuff, like her her um, different like personalities. I have no idea how you are supposed to convey that, like on screen, well, <laughs> and make it make sense. Yeah. So. And that doesn't mean it's good or bad, you know, if it, if it can't be portrayed on screen super easily. Uh, but it's been frustrating, to I feel like, to follow as a reader. And like I said, it's very different from our other storylines, which seem to, like, be somewhat coming together. Like, yeah. Teravangian, Renarin, Zeth, Dalinar, Kaladin, all of them. That it's, like, it's it's been harder for me to read the Shalon chapters. So, Shalon reigned over. <laughs> The, um, are you are you prepared to have your mind changed real quick? Yes, I would love I would love for it to be changed. Or so you, the, your original claim of I feel like Shalon Shalon's story is is being set up for later. Mm-hmm. I think you missed something in this chapter. Okay. Okay. Shalon is talking, or sorry, Radiant is talking to Pattern, and Pattern is saying. So for a while there, I thought it was good for Shalon to remember her past. But then it caused more harm than good, so I stopped. But now that we're here, I would like Shalon to meet someone. Do you remember this? This is the right this is about three quarters of the way through 75. And Pattern says, I'd like Shalon to meet someone. And he kind of looks over his shoulder. And then Shalon, there's a, there's one line, which I'll come back to in a second. And then Shalon takes over, shoves Vale and Radiant in the back, turns around and walks away. 
Who did did you did you catch this? I I know what you're talking about. My only assumptions. I'm trying to think who could be here. I mean, my only assumptions are like. I don't know, maybe Kalak can help. <laughs> but, like, Pattern didn't know it was Kalak, right? And Kalak's not quite there yet. He's almost there, yeah, but he's not there that's yet. that's true. I was super I... frustrated by that because it seemed to be leading to a very important moment. Pattern brings a cryptic. Yes. That's a dead eye. Correct. And, and, and is like, Shalon, you have to meet this person. And then story just kind of whips the other direction, which, yes, thinking back on that is very possibly quite intentional by Shalon of, yes. oh, crap, nope, can't deal with that. We're going this way. And we, we don't even revisit that. Like, that happens in chapter 75. That's the first of our four chapters here. We don't go back to it. It's just, whoop, gone. Yes. So I was left like, who the heck was that? Over pattern shoulder is what appears to be a Deadeye cryptic and says, Sean, you should meet this person. What does that mean? And I, a thought just popped into my head as, as you were talking about this, which I love how this happens, how just talking with you guys spawns all kinds of, you know, ideas oh, yeah. and stuff. Oh, yeah. W one of which might be Okay, let's step back for a second. We're going to bite you off for just a little bit. Yep. I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with our, our timeline, our Shalon history timeline. Okay. We were shown a storyline where Shalon meets Pattern for the first time on a ship, and they have this super cute, like, discovery and introduction, and Pattern, like, is bumping into the table because he doesn't even know how to move around the world. And, and Pattern brings oh, this up in this chapter of that's how they met. We mm -hmm. met on the ship. He specifically says that. And this is not the first time I think that that has come up as the when did Shalon meet Pattern? And it's, it's mind bending because we, we know that Shalon had Pattern before then because she kills her mother with a shard blade correct so she had to have had a sprint at that time uh -huh. so the question is the question i've been wrestling with for a while is does pattern not remember that does pattern is he lying intentionally about that and uh, that's kind of where i was leaning to recently was is is pattern intentionally hiding that from shallan was he pretending this whole time to be to be meeting her for the first time was was that what went down but what just struck my brain that might be hitting that same lightning bolt might be hitting Paul here at the same time, based on his facial expressions here. Uh -huh. What if the shard blade that Shalon killed her mother with was not pattern? What if it was a different cryptic, that cryptic that's standing there that pattern wants to introduce her to? That's gotta be it. So, okay. Interesting. Okay. I, hold on. <laughs> okay. A couple thoughts. I love this podcast. One. One. Uh, I, okay. I'm going to, for the purpose of, of this conversation, right quick, I'm going to assume this is where we're right. We're going to assume this uh, dead eye cryptic is the shard blade that she used back then, that she like had as a child. Right, we talked about how pattern was there, but maybe it was a pattern. It was, uh, old pattern. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so you could bond. One person could bond a multiple spren. Then, right? Not like at the same time necessarily. Okay. We don't know that. But bonded a spren, killed that spren, and then rebonded another spren. And Shalon doesn't want to admit it. That she killed uh, a friend. She refuses to think. Does she know? Correct. It feels like she, she doesn't, doesn't even know. know. She doesn't know. And she refuses to face the fact that she has killed a spren. And she all she wants to think about is pattern has been here the whole time. And she blames the death of remember, she blames the death of her mother on pattern. 
because she doesn't know. Like, like that's like as far as she knows, Pattern has always been there. But now Pattern is just now saying we met on the boat. Or that's like when she remembers like meeting him. But she mm-hmm. has, she's assuming that he's just been there since she was a child. Correct. And and Pattern takes the blame for her mother's death because he knows that she cannot handle the truth of this other spren that she killed. So she accidentally kills her mother with, well, she self-defense kills her mother with a shard blade. Trauma, obviously, hides the shard blade away and does not think about it for years, which kills the spren. And then another cryptic is then attracted to her pattern. She starts over from square one. Okay. Once take, I'm going to take this another step further. Okay. So we've seen Adolin with Maya, right? He, she has not like come alive or anything, but she has shown some like signs of life or some things that are quote impossible for a dead eye to do. Uh huh. What happens if sh- if if this dead eye if this is Shalon's previously bonded or present like cryptic? What happens if it starts to come back or exhibit similar behavior as Maya? Is she gonna have two <laughs> cryptics? <laughs> is she gonna dual wield shard blades? I'm getting more like your ex shows back up in your life after you've gotten over them and started dating someone yeah. new vibes off of this. Yes, exactly. Cue duel of fates where Darth Maul gets the double sided. Yes. Yeah, exactly. All right. So um, with, with that two lines of set sentence that I assume you missed, Paul, that I wanted to bring to your attention, um, would you say that we're getting a little bit more traction with the with the Shalon storyline? Yes, that is really cool. I, I'm a big fan. I'm curious to see where that goes. I hadn't thought of that. Um, but in my mind, I was like, we're still in this like kind of ghost bloods phase, and I mm-hmm. don't know when that's going to come into fruition, so I'm assuming later. Yep. Um, but But that is pretty cool. I'd be excited to see that. Um. Yeah, I, I'm also briefly mentioning the Adolin uh, moment of this chapter. Um, I'm really excited for him to go on trial because, <laughs> like, it's set up. I feel like this is set up like the Kaladin High Storm in, se- like I said, season one. Or I was thinking season one, Way of Kings. <laughs> Man, I need to stop thinking about TV shows. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um. Where I don't know, I, I trust Brandon Sanderson's writing to, at, at a minimum, present a really awesome scene and dialogue with a trial. Mm-hmm. Um, but to I, I I don't know. I feel like he is gonna be fine, or or something big is gonna happen, and I'm really excited to see that. I don't know where that will go, but I'm sure it will be something cool. Yeah. Uh, quick side note. Uh, Shalon finds people from Nalthus in in Lasting Integrity. Did you catch that, guys? Yes. She's, she notices they deliberately look different than Azure did. Azure looked Alethi. Um, but Nalthus, she finds people from Nalthus and uh, Vale's like, oh yeah, that's pretty cool. And Radiance, like, well, Please think about that for a second. These people are from a different planet. We need to acknowledge that and acknowledge the weight of that, like what that means for us. And then we move on. So Warbreaker is uh, just a, another Stormlight book in disguise. <clears throat> All right. Completely switching gears. Uh, 76, Novani and Raboniel, this whole dynamic that we've fostered over the last part three here 
I was under the assumption that this whole relationship was going to be over. Raboniel betrays Navani, r- reveals that I've been spying on you with the sibling the whole time. And Navani, at the beginning of this chapter, is kind of on the same page. It's like, I don't want to help you with research anymore. I don't care. You completely backstabbed me. And Raboniel says, uh, uh, please don't, please don't do that. I, I really need you to help me because we're actually onto something here. Which by the end of the chapter, they are onto something here. What'd you guys, what'd you guys get from this chapter? Navani just can't resist, can she? Her her curiosity is too, too strong. There's there's a thread of discovery here, and she can't not pull on it. Even if that means having to work with Raboniel, who has betrayed her multiple times, clearly it is is not about to actually help her in any way here. But uh, that itch for discovery, Navani can't resist. Yes. So Raboniel and Navani find st- Storm Void Light. What would you guys like to call this? I've got a couple different options in the in the outline here. Which one's your favorite? See Stoid Light. <laughs> yep, st- we have Stoid Light, Hanodium. H- on Odi- on on Odium Light. Void Void Vo- Vo- Vorm Light. Void Storm Light, Vorm Light. I kind of like warm light. Odin or light? That's hard to say. All right. I I tried to combine (laughs) Navani and Raboniel in my head. I I was going for the two like discoverers here. So like Rabovani light or something like that. Navoniel. Yeah. Navoniel. Navoniel. Somebody in the Discord. Somebody in the Discord suggested a much more logical name for it. And that was. Oh, is this like uh, my Shalamaram <laughs> <laughs> from, from her? From no, no, yeah. no, no. In, instead of it's... some some goofy smashing of words together, they they just said that they would call it Warlight. No, nah, which boo. yeah, I, I read that. I was like, uh, okay, yep, that makes way more sense than my goofy <laughs> mental gymnastics. Yes, what well, Warlight? I believe is the semi-canonical name for it because it's the rhythm of war that combines them and it describes it as a dark black blue which is a great mental image by the way i love that and Mm -hmm. they sing their nice little honor and odium lullaby here could successfully combine these these gems and we get warlight Let's uh, let's describe that in a little bit more detail because I found it fascinating after our discussion about music theory the yep. last couple of episodes and then even some more fantastic notes thrown in our, our Discord channel from, from some of our listeners had some good discussion in there about it. They realize as they're trying to combine these that the light, our, our investiture, this voice of the gods if you will the voice of a shard it puts off not just a tone it doesn't it doesn't just respond to that pure tone of roshar that it associates with it also has a rhythm and so tone and rhythm navani before was just using tones she just had her her tuning forks right yep where she she's figured out the right tones but she she can't get the light to combine with just the tones what rabonio helps with because Raboniel can hear this because we know the singers are so in tune with Roshar or whatever it is where they hear the rhythms that that's you no know, constant throughout any sort of singer point of view right is they're switching between different rhythms so Raboniel explains well no the light has a rhythm as well but then they look at tower light or they talk about tower light and realize that Tower light is a harmony of the two tones it was used to combine, and it has a combined rhythm that is neither stormlight rhythm nor lifelight rhythm. It's sort of a combination of the two. Yep. And so what they have to get to, which they do incredibly impressively with just their voices, they being Navani and Raboniel here, are able to harmonize the tones of odium 
and honor and the rhythms of stormlight and voidlight combine all of that into one and that is what becomes our I'm blanking on the word now warlight our, well war warlight but the 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 mechanism for combining the two emulsifier thank you yes that becomes our emulsifier that blends the two lights together into one i thought it was fascinating yeah it does it live up to all of your theorizing from what last week two weeks ago i definitely i am always a fan of music stuff and like singing in fantasy i just think it's really cool um and this this was really cool and i think it's a really just like I didn't expect this to become a part of our story. We are yeah. like almost four full books out of five. Um, like that's our progress through this story. And there hasn't really been much to do with music. We've, we've seen these rhythms. We've heard like um, stuff like that with the Parshendi, but there really has been no other mention of music or tones or rhythms or all this stuff, you know, other than with our Parshendi. We know it's a part of their life. Yep. Um, But I think we're learning that it is a part of all life, maybe on Roshar, um, and not not just our, like, Parshendi here. Um, And I thought it was really cool. I think the harmony is a cool emulsifier um, and, like, incorporating the rhythms and that Navani was able to hear the rhythms. Um, Yeah. See, that really, like caught me off guard and I, I don't fully understand why she could or how she could she just kind of like tried didn't she so so um, this one actually was the most fascinating part of, for this chapter for me so she takes stormlight spheres with stormlight in it and straps it to her arm and gets Raboniel to start singing honor's tone honor's rhythm and she does and the the stormlight in the spheres begins resonating and vibrating with the same rhythm. Um, and so as soon as Raboniel cuts off, she can still feel the rhythm on her skin, and that's how she tunes herself with it, because the stormlight on her skin is still vibrating to Honor's rhythm. And so that's how she can match it, based on just pressing stormlight spheres to her skin and feeling the rhythm pushing against her skin. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, that's pretty awesome. There's an interesting note in here, though. Rabonio says that she's tried this already. And yet, the only thing different here is she's using, now they have a human right. in, in the mix here. So I was actually quite curious if that was a necessary part of this combination, or if that's maybe just a, like, enough of a difference or new element that kind of allowed the discovery to happen. But I I thought that was interesting that the human who struggles to hear the rhythms, but is able to with the, the gemstones on her skin was potentially the catalyst here. The, the way I interpreted it is if you had two singers, they would not deviate from their original rhythm. Because the uh. way the way they get the emulsifier is they both have to come to the middle and meet in a new harmony. And if you had two singers singing their original rhythms, they're not going to change because they can still hear their original like their their original rhythms. But if you ha- have a bass line of a singer sticking to a normal rhythm of odium and then an honor one that's able to like be changed and have that meet in the middle somewhere, that's what does it. So that makes sense. The the human is flawed enough and able to change their rhythm enough to that it can harmonize with each other. That does make sense. The the ultimate destination that we get to though is super cool. The the rhythm of war. Yes. I I did not expect such a cool definition or like what is the rhythm of war as this combination, this harmony of odium and honor. I was just expecting, you know, when we picked up this book, 
Rhythm of War. Okay. I know that Parshendi, that singers hear rhythms. Okay. Clearly there must be a rhythm of war. Simple enough. Yep. Ah, but it's so much more complex than that, Yep. which is so cool. And it's, it's so, it just makes sense. If you think about it, war itself is an equally chaotic, but controlled thing. You can have an, a very honorable war. There are very honorable reasons to go to war. In fact, honor, I think, should drive you to go to war in certain scenarios. Yeah. But at the same time, war for the sake of war or an unjustified war is a very chaotic or emotional or whatever you want to kind of passion driven, whatever you want to associate with odium, a very odium like thing. It's destructive. It's evil. If you want to go down down that thread, all of these things describe war, and so the combination of the two. I, I would have been re- with Raboniel at the beginning of this. How, if you combine odium and honor, what do you get? Yeah. Probably nothing. Explosions, <laughs> right? Yeah, I don't know. But war is a perfect answer to that question. It is brilliant. So, I do want to highlight this from Raboniel's point of view here. What is, and she's mentioned this time and time again, what is Raboniel expecting from this experiment? Let, let's say they do successfully combine void light and storm light in one sphere. So far, they haven't been able to do it. What If it were possible, what is Raboniel fully expecting to happen? Antimatter. The explosion that we saw from earlier in the book. Now, it's easy to think about this chapter of like, oh, yeah, they finally did it. That's really cool. They were holding hands over the sphere. They like they united them. But think about this from Raboniel. Raboniel is willing to do this. Why? I was thinking of it as she didn't think it was going to actually work. But what if it does work? The way she, the, the way Raboniel assumes it's going to work. Well, then she'd have her anti light, which apparently she has plans for. Right, but first they both explode. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> and Raboniel comes back with the next ever storm. Right. So R- Raboniel is fully prepared to sacrifice Navani to accomplish whatever they're about to discover here and raboniel is going to have no repercussions no matter what happens here because yeah let's say the room explodes like raboniel's expecting i would even go as far to assume that maybe that's happened in the past that if they've if they've played with this a couple times that maybe they did accidentally find antimatter and they've lost some fuse but they don't care they just come back with the next ever storm so Raboniel is fully expecting the room to explode and Navani to die. And the fact that it doesn't and that it does successfully come to a emulsified mix, that is when it it really shocks Raboniel and she picks up the sphere with like a shaking hand of like, oh, I was definitely wrong. But this is not all like, oh, they united. That's so cute. No, no, Raboniel was fully prepared to sacrifice Navani. Don't get yourself confused. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. It is. I, I mean, Rabonia, like, when I think of our fused people right now, I mean, they definitely just have their life as a resource. They can just throw it however they want because they'll come right back. Right. So that makes sense. And then the flip side of that the revelation that Avani comes to during all of this is, oh, Gavilar was playing around with this. This is maybe one of a, a warlight sphere is maybe one of the spheres that she saw on the table. Cause she saw, she said she saw a mul- like a multitude of different spheres, different colors on the prologue night. And, Raboniel says, do you know how Honor died? Honor died by some sort of 
anti-investiture mechanic. And that dawns on Navani of like, wait, Gavilar was looking for this. Gavilar was looking for an anti-investiture tool. And I had one, and I accidentally blew up my scholars with it. It's definitely a oh oh man kind of moment of this is the kind of stuff Gavilar from the very beginning of our story was messing with is a weapon to kill a god. Yeah. And and not like a light song god, a shard god. Mm-hmm. Side note, it really bothers me that back in the Way of Kings, Brandon Sanderson went with the term shard bearer for someone who has a shard blade when we needed that term for someone who holds a shard of adenalsium. We needed shard bearer to mean that, not anyway. Should have picked a different term in my opinion. But <laughs> because because now you have to be like shard vessel, shard holder, shard or oh, whatever. Fair. A shareholder, but short, yeah. Yes. I did write down a note that Raboniel thinks that, or at least she claims that, having this power, this God-killing power, is her path to peace. She says, she says to Navani, basically, this is my plan. We can finally achieve peace of this war between our two races that cannot be stopped by anything else if I can wield this power over everybody. And I just kind of wrote down, that's not how that usually goes. But bigger weapons don't usually do a great job of ending wars. Or when they do, really bad things happen. Yeah, peace for who? Are we, who are we talking about? Right, right. True, true peace happens with the the laying down of weapons not the who can build the biggest stick right anything else from this chapter don't think so the only question that remains for me is We've successfully combined Stormlight and Voidlight. Still leaves the open question of where the heck did Gavilar get his anti-light sphere from? Where where did where on Roshar or off of Roshar did that come from? I thought about this for a minute and right now I'm just fully in the book that it is all it is three lights. It is a three-way harmony meeting in the middle. Um, okay. Of all three of our lights, maybe all four. That's the TBD. But, Ooh, all four. Uh, but it does specify that this was different from Zeth's light sphere, light to Gavilar's light sphere. Um, and so my my I instantly had that question in my head. What is that one now? Yep. And so it's my guess is just all three. My my guess is it's a different mechanic entirely, more more along the lines of dare I say Nightblood level of like sucking in destruction stuff. Like if you put a sphere next to Nightblood and sucked some of that, that's that's what you would get. I mean, like we've talked about with these frequencies and stuff. Like hypothetically, if it uh. If you found the frequency to pull that light out, what happens? You know? Hit Nightblood with a tuning fork. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh-huh. I thought of Nightblood too. And I am definitely going down the mental path of this seems different. Almost, I guess my question is going to be is the. We keep using the term antimatter, which maybe that's not the best way to be referring to it, but anti-light or whatever. Opposite light, I think, is how they sometimes refer to it in the story. Is that stuff 
investiture? Yep, that's a good question. That's going to be my question. Is is it investiture? Because investiture so far, not just on Roshar, is a source of magical power. You can do magical stuff with it. It's an it's more of a additive thing. It's you're going to do positive stuff with it. I mean, you can do evil stuff with it if you want, but you're going to add to instead of take away. Mm -hmm. This opposite light seems like a, and and Nightblood is kind of in this category of a a consuming. It's a absorbing and not giving anything back. That doesn't seem like investiture to me. Right. Is so the question is, is there some absorbing black shard out there? that would spawn Nightblood and Aura Power like this, or is it the opposite right. of Vestiture itself? Right. Yeah. That's a good question. All right. 77. We get a prologue chapter, Venli prologue chapter, out of the blue. Ulim and Venli are sneaking around Kolinar, and they they sneak up all the way to like some upper floor chamber pot room and ulim is kind of freaking out because he hasn't heard from his contact reaches reaches into this chamber pot reads the message and says oh zindweth left okay um well that just told us a couple things do paul do you remember who zindweth is No. Go ahead, Elliot. Exend with, and I had to pull some stuff out of my memory banks as well on this one. Exend with, we saw her not too long ago. Exend with was the random she like helper that. person that Venli meets in Gavilar's entourage, like out in the wilds. When they first meet like Dalinar and Gavilar, they're learning about each other. They're having chats. It's all chummy and, and friendly. And then this person just kind of pulls Venley aside and they have a discussion. And you quickly learn that this person knows a lot. That was X and with. And our defining feature we got for her was a handful of rings. Right, Trevor? Oh. Yep. The ring lady. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. I remember ring lady. Yep. I did not ever remember hearing this name, X and with. So... She, long story short, she is the one who gives Venli the sphere that Ulim is in. Exendweth gives Venli the sphere, says, take this into a storm. You will get the the powers that you're seeking. It'll heal your mother, is the hook that she gets Venli with. And so she takes the sphere into the storm. Ulim pops out and says, hey, what's up? We're going to save the world and bring back Odium Storm. Um, so that is Exendweth. They come to the palace on prologue night and they're supposed to meet with Exendweth. Exendweth leaves a note here that says she got found by the other specialist in the palace and she left. And Venley's like, uh, left like for the night, left the palace. And Ulim's like super annoyed at it and says, no, left Roshar. Like, she's she's gone. She hopped into Shadesmar and is gone. And Fenley has no idea what we're talking about. What do you guys think and of the other specialist? I'm fascinated by that. Because th- this whole, this fits into our whole picture, too, of the, what, I, what I'm kind of calling the loophole. We've learned that Fused are getting around the Oath Pact. They're coming in onto Roshar, assumedly from Braze, through this kind of confusing method, but that's very complicated, but they can be pulled over into a sphere, into a gemstone. And Ulam has talked about how they have to have agents who, like what I was assuming was human agents, go back to that, um, 
go and collect the spheres and then you know deliver them where they need to go. That that's what they were doing on this night. They were going to go collect some fused souls that had been brought across. The terminology here, though, in this sentence is interesting. The way Ulim talks about it. She's a very specific and rare kind of specialist. The details need not concern you. But there is apparently another of her kind in the palace, an agent for someone else. They found her and turned the human king against her. She's decided to pull out. That, that's a lot of kind of specific terminology that seems to point at another of her kind. Like, are we not even talking about humans anymore? This also lends itself to the fact that Gavilar did not go and get those those spheres by himself. He was delivered them because Ulim and Venli are here to pick up Voidlight spheres with Voidlight Spren in them. And instead, Exenweth gets found, turned into the king, Exenweth leaves, and then Gavilar has a bunch of Void Light Spheres. Gives one to Eshenai. Remember, in Oathbringer Prologue, Eshenai walks in and freaks out that there's Void Light Spheres on the table, and Gavilar's like, yo, we're going to bring back your gods, it's going to be great. And uh -huh. Eshenai's like, no, please no, and kills him. And well, goes and buys Zeth, and then Zeth kills him. Uh huh. I remember that part for sure. Um. So somewhere along the path, there is someone in the palace who delivered these void light spheres that Ulim was supposed to pick up to Gavilar. Gavilar picked them up. It's more hints towards what could end up being a new entity out here, which I'm trying to figure out. You know, we've kind of had ghost bloods as kind of our catch all behind the scenes fixers gathering information. This is not ghost bloods. This is something different. So yeah. is this purely just agents of the fused? It seems like more than that. It seems like Ulim is working with this person but this person seems like they're tied into maybe something even bigger, you know, interplanetary bigger. Yeah. And if you caught it, there's actually a one-liner here that reveals that Kalak is in the palace. Ulim comes back to Venli and says, yo, I just saw heralds. We've got, first I saw Shalash and I wasn't too terribly concerned. And then I walked around the corner and Nail and uh, Kalak were there. And if you remember... Nail was confirmed at the banquet before, but he was also walking around with this other guy um, who was called Rastaris, uh, and he was, you could then assume, was Kalak. So actually a chapter, bef next chapter in 78, we actually get the, the spelled out reveal, but if you put two and two together, you can figure out that Rastaris is Kalak in this chapter. Which, by the way, was probably my favorite thing about this episode. Um, well, like coming into this episode, honestly, I think my favorite thing is learning about the secondary spread for Shalon. Maybe that is really cool. Uh, I'm very glad that you told me about that, Trevor. Uh, but I'm really excited. Because, so whenever we first found Tom, end of first book, mm -hmm. I was so excited. And, and I still love it. I, I love Tom, even though he's literally just insane. I give him, I'll give him some slack. He's been through a lot, right? We've talked about this, uh, <laughs> but I feel like Kalak sounds like he might be more normal. He might have his wits about him more so, um, or at least I'm holding on to that. And so I'm hoping we're gonna we're gonna hear something. We're gonna hear some more. Maybe we'll learn more about the Oath Pact. Maybe we'll learn more about lots of things. Uh, maybe that's also me wishfully thinking. So, and on the topic of is Kalak insane or not, 
pull back to now that we know that Ristari's is Kalak, pull back to Yasna's prologue, beginning of Words of Radiance. Yasna walks past Nail and Kal- Ristari's in the hallway, and before they mm-hmm. see her, they're like K- Kalak is saying. Ishar said that we weren't supposed to go insane. Are you going insane? I'm not insane. Am I insane? And he's just like drilling nail on like sanity questions. So Kalak at this point on the prologue does not think he's insane. And that's only six years before, or six or seven years before um, common or before like current day. When, you know, compare that to the thousands of years that he's been. Uh, hanging out so between the prologue and current day he somehow goes and hides in lasting integrity um or maybe he already was there and just shows up for the banquet for some reason um but kalak does not think he's insane whereas shalash would probably agree with you that i'm not mentally sane um or, you know, like, none of us are mentally sane, like, that type of thing. Kalak is still questioning the fact, at this point, of am I thinking rationally or not. Does that help you? To confuse you? I, I'm skeptical. We'll see. We'll see. Anything else for this episode? Uh, that was enough to break my brain for a while. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, yeah, it was a lot of kind of like difficult things to to connect right now. I mean, in typical fashion, maybe it'll all be like revealed next episode. Who knows? But like right now, it's like, all right, if you think back to w- Words of Radiance <laughs> prologue, then maybe you could figure out who this character is a chapter early. You know, like, um. Yeah, it's it's a bit it's a bit silly in that yep. regard, but I'm really excited always to go forward um, in part four. Things are ramping up. Like I said, I'm super excited to see our uh, Adolin content, honestly, coming up. Yeah. The the one part of seventy eight that we didn't talk about, just real quick, the Adolin uh, trial that's coming up. The little snafu there is Adolin's like, well, as long as we're honorable about it, I should be fine in this in this trial. And his little ink spren advisor dude says, well, I mean, if you're going by your definition of honor, then yes. But honor spren are like, honor's dead, so we can define honor however we want is how they think about it. So you're in trouble. <laughs> So we'll see how that goes. Yeah, that that ink spren helper that Adolin has is just uh, just a just a bucket of sunshine for sure. And I say that completely ironically, sarcastically. All right, let us keep reading, and we will reconvene next week. Thanks for joining me, Paul and Elliot. See ya. Peace.